What if everything you thought you knew about your marriage turned out to be nothing but a sham? How do you even begin to handle it when, in an instant, your entire world collapses? My wife and I had been together for 29 years, married for 26 of them. I'm 51, she's 49. We've raised two kids together, a son who's now 24 and a daughter who's 22. We met back in college, fell hard for each other, tied the knot, and, from what I believed, built a solid, happy life. We shared hobbies, communicated well, and faced challenges side by side. Our careers thrived because we supported each other. Even though our intimacy wasn't as wild as in our younger days, the passion was still there. She's in IT, and I own a landscaping business with 75 employees, something I started right after graduating. She'd been working from home more often, and we'd even talked about me stepping back from the business and her going part-time so we could enjoy more time together, especially now that the kids were grown. Looking back, I missed every warning sign, or maybe there just weren't any. No sneaky texting, no guarding her phone, no change in her appearance, nothing out of the ordinary. She'd go out with friends or family, and I'd always hear, last week, I had planned a surprise anniversary weekend getaway at a friend's cozy bed and breakfast during the winter festival. I knocked off work early, excited to surprise her, and told her to pack for a trip. But when I pulled into the driveway, there was a car I didn't recognize. My gut churned instantly. I hoped I was wrong, but my instincts screamed otherwise. I sat there, torn. Should I leave? Confront her later? Pretend I saw nothing. I was shaking so hard I could barely think straight. But then, out of nowhere, a strange calm washed over me, even though inside, I was unraveling. I slipped in quietly through the back door. My black lab was lying there, looking oddly sad. Not his usual happy, tail-wagging self. That dog's always been by my side. But today, he didn't even budge. I crept upstairs, and as I got closer to our bedroom, the sounds I heard confirmed my worst fears. I swung the door open, and there he was, her boss, on top of my wife. For a split second, I just stood there before yelling, surprise. The chaos that followed would have been laughable if it hadn't been so damn tragic. He scrambled, tangled in the sheets, trying to escape, while my wife kept shrieking, oh my god. As she tried to cover herself, but couldn't because he was still wrapped up in the bedding. When he finally managed to free himself, he frantically looked for his clothes, which, ironically, were strewn across the room in the exact spot mine usually landed. Before he could grab them, I picked them up. My wife was sobbing, repeatedly saying, I'm so sorry. I stepped back to the door, standing there as he stood beside the bed, completely naked. I grabbed the armchair from the corner, dragged it over, and sat down by the door. When he asked for his clothes, I tossed him my wife's robe from the door. He moved toward me, but I cut him off. Now I'm 51, but I've stayed in good shape. 6 feet 3 inches, 240 pounds, years of gym workouts and running a landscaping business have kept me strong. I looked him dead in the eye and said, you come any closer and this ends badly. You end up in the hospital and I end up in jail. So how about you just take a seat? By now, my wife had buried her face in the pillow, sobbing, and he sat down, defeated. After a painfully awkward silence, he asked, what now? I replied honestly, I have no idea. My wife's sobs had quieted a bit, and she sat up slightly. After a moment, I pulled out my phone and said, you're both going to tell me everything and I'm recording it. They exchanged nervous glances before my wife, trembling, asked, what do you mean by everything? I shot back. Exactly what I said. How it started, how long it's been going on, every hotel, every dinner, every lie. All of it. She tried to insist this was a one-time thing, but I wasn't buying it. Bullshit. You don't get comfortable enough to bring him into our bed unless this has been going on for a while. If you lie to me again, I'm walking out that door and filing for divorce tomorrow. 
She broke down, sobbing harder. Over the next agonizing 10 to 15 minutes, the truth came out. They'd been sleeping together for over nine months. Started with him flirting, then a lunch, a few drinks, and a hotel room. She came home to me that night like nothing had happened. She swore it had been tearing her apart, that she wanted to tell me but didn't know how. But I wasn't letting her off that easy. If it was tearing you apart, you wouldn't have kept doing it so easily. I snapped. I learned they even went to a week-long work conference I used to attend with her, but she told me spouses weren't allowed anymore. Another lie. I pocketed my phone, and the room went quiet again. Then an idea hit me. I rifled through his clothes, found his phone, and asked for his passcode. Surprisingly, he gave it to me. As I scrolled through, I found pictures of a woman I figured was his wife. Lisa, he told me. She was attractive, though not as stunning as my wife, and I told him as much. There were also pictures of their kids, three of them, and then a family portrait. I held up the phone, looked him dead in the eye, and asked, why would you risk all this for a fling with my wife? He just stared at me. Dumbfounded, so I added, you do realize this is all about to blow up, right? Do you really think Lisa won't find out? His face turned white. How would she find out? Because I'm calling her right now, I said, holding up his phone. He jumped to his feet. No, you can't. My wife screamed. Please, don't do this to him. That's when I lost it. Don't do this to him. You've destroyed me. You've wrecked our family, our friends, our future, and you're worried about him. I started trembling again, trying to hold back tears, but I couldn't stop them. I slumped back into the chair and sobbed. When I finally pulled myself together, I looked back at his phone. He begged me again. Please, I'll tell her. I swear. I just shook my head. Yeah, sure you will. He stood there, still begging, while I found her number and decided FaceTime would really drive the point home. When she answered, her face filled with confusion, and she asked, Who are you? Is my husband okay? I kept my voice steady and replied, He's fine for now, but that's about to change. Then I switched the camera, showing her husband standing there in my wife's floral robe. I said, I believe you're familiar with this man. He's standing in my bedroom, wearing my wife's robe. I panned the camera to my wife, who was desperately trying to hide under the sheets, but it was too late for that. That woman. That's my wife. I came home early today and found them in bed together. I honestly felt terrible for her, especially with how I was breaking the news, but there was no easy way to do it. Her eyes welled up, and before she could even process it, her husband blurted out the classic line, Honey, I'm so sorry. I can explain. It was just one time. I quickly cut in, don't believe a word of that. This has been going on for over nine months. I've spent the last fifteen minutes getting all the sordid details on record. I told her I'd sent her my contact info and asked her to text me her email, so I could forward the video of their confession. As I handed him his phone back, I heard her voice crack through the warning that his stuff would be packed and waiting outside, and if he tried stepping foot in the house, she'd call the cops. She hung up. I tossed his clothes at him, and after he got dressed, he made a quick exit, leaving just me and my wife in the aftermath. She started to crumble, tears pouring as she apologized repeatedly, saying she never meant to hurt me, begging for forgiveness. She claimed the whole thing meant nothing, just more typical cheater's lines. I just stared at her for a moment before I told her to pack up her things and get out. I couldn't look at her anymore. I headed downstairs and poured myself a drink, needing something to steady my hands. As I sat on the couch, I heard her come down the stairs. She hesitated for a second, then started walking toward me. I didn't even look at her. Stop right there, I said. She tried again, asking if we could talk about it. I told her, maybe, but not now. 
Then I added, it's going to be damn hard not to see a divorce attorney. That set her off crying again. She opened her mouth like she was about to say, I love you, but I cut her off before the words left her lips. Don't you dare say that right now. I'll never believe it again. With that, she turned and walked out the door, leaving my whole world in pieces. When she left, I collapsed. I broke down, falling to the floor, shaking uncontrollably, sobbing like I'd never sobbed before. I don't know how long I lay there, but eventually, I managed to sit up, still crying, and reached for my phone. I called my best friend, Michael. The moment I tried to speak, the tears took over again, and I couldn't get a word out. He kept asking what was wrong, but I couldn't respond. Finally, he asked, are you at home? I barely managed to grunt out a yes, and he said, I'm coming over. About half an hour later, he walked into my living room. I was still a mess, unable to say anything. I handed him my phone, the video ready to play. He took it and started watching, but I couldn't bear to hear it again. I headed to the kitchen to pour us both another drink. Michael followed me, took my drink away, dumped them both down the sink. This isn't going to help you, man, he said. He was right, but I didn't know what else to do. He told me I couldn't stay there alone that night, insisting I pack a bag. When I came back downstairs, he already had my lab, Cooper, on a leash, ready to go. We left for his place. For those of you who've asked about Michael, yeah, he's a great friend. Our families have been close for years. Our kids grew up together, and we used to go on family camping trips. His wife, Julia, became good friends with my wife over the years, which is where things got a bit more complicated. On the drive over, I didn't say a word. Michael, on the other hand, was getting angrier by the minute. When we arrived, Michael stormed into his house and immediately asked Julia, did you know? She looked completely confused. Know what? She asked. He raised his voice. Did you know about this? I had to step in. Michael calmed down. This isn't her fault. Realizing he was out of line, he apologized to Julia and gave her a hug. But Julia was left bewildered. Michael handed her my phone and simply said, show her. I stepped outside with my dog, not wanting to hear it all over again. When it was over, Julia came outside in tears and hugged me tightly. She took my hand, and we walked back inside. We spent the next hour just talking, crying, trying to make sense of it all. My phone wouldn't stop buzzing. My wife kept calling and sending texts, but I deleted them without even reading. Then my son called. He was confused, asking what was going on because his mom had shown up at his place, saying I'd kicked her out. I asked him, did she tell you why? He said she hadn't, so I told him to hand her the phone and make her explain. He pushed back, asking, what's this about? I told him, if she doesn't tell you, I'll send you the video. I hung up. Ten minutes later, he called back, sobbing uncontrollably, barely able to get out. WTF. Over and over, hearing him break down like that shattered me, and I switched into dad mode, doing my best to comfort him. I reassured him that it wasn't his fault, and that we'd be okay. He calmed down and asked if I was alright. Of course not, I replied, voice shaking. He told me his mom would stay at his place that night, and we ended the call quickly. My phone rang again, this time it was my daughter. I'd forgotten I'd asked her to watch Cooper while my wife and I were supposed to be away for the weekend. She was confused, asking where the dog was. I told her, plans have changed, we're not going anywhere, but you can still stay at the house. She paused before asking, what do you mean neither of you? Where are you? I told her I was at Michael and Julia's, and her mom was staying with her brother. She immediately pressed, Dad, tell me what's going on, but I couldn't. Not now, honey, I'll come by the house tomorrow and we'll talk then. She tried to push, but I refused. Eventually, she gave up and ended the call. 
I knew her next move. I quickly texted my son to give him a heads up. Then I called my wife, asking if she was ready to tell our daughter or if I had to do it. She just sobbed. I hung up on her. Half an hour later, there was a knock at the door. Michael answered and in walked my daughter. She took one look at me, and we both broke down, embracing each other tightly. She still didn't know why I was so torn up, but she knew it was serious. When we pulled ourselves together, I called my wife again. I told her that our daughter was here with me and asked, once more, if she was ready to tell her the truth or if I should put her on speaker. My daughter, hearing the one-sided conversation, chimed in, Mom, what do you need to tell me? But all we heard from the other side of the line was more crying. So, I took a deep breath and decided it was time to step up. I ended the call without letting my wife say anything else and broke the news myself. I found out today that your mom has been having an affair for the last nine months. I thought nothing could hurt me more than discovering the affair. But when I saw the pain on my little girl's face, it completely destroyed me. She stood there trembling, too shocked to even cry, while I fell to the floor, a broken mess, sobbing uncontrollably. I wanted to comfort her, but I was paralyzed by my own pain, feeling like I'd failed her when she needed me the most. Julia, with tears in her own eyes, rushed to my daughter's side, hugging her and assuring her that somehow, things would eventually be okay. Even Michael, who's normally rock solid, had tears streaming down his face. Our families have always been so close, and now this, it shattered everything. My daughter's gut-wrenching sob was something I'll never forget. After what felt like an eternity, I pulled myself together enough to join them both in an embrace, all of us holding on like we were trying to keep from falling apart. We eventually sat down on the couch, none of us able to find the right words. I looked at my daughter, trying to be strong for her, and asked, Are you going to be alright? She surprised me by turning the question around. Dad, don't worry about me. Are you going to be okay? I swallowed hard and forced out a shaky, I'll cope. She then asked if she could take Cooper back to the house with her, and if her fiancé, Ryan, could stay there with her. Of course, I said yes. I didn't want her to be alone in that house either. After she left, Julia was furious. I can't believe she did this, she fumed, calling my wife every name under the sun. She eventually cooled off a bit, picked up her phone, and told me she was going to call her. I just looked at her and said, go ahead, but make sure it's on speaker. So, she dialed my wife, starting with small talk, but quickly got to the point. She told her that I had called Michael, sobbing, after I found out, and that I was now staying at their place. Then Julia let loose. What were you thinking? How could you do this? Why didn't you come talk to me before everything went so far? And if you were having problems, why didn't you talk to Mike? He's one of the most understanding people I know. Do you have any idea how many people you've hurt? Our daughter just left here, and the look on her face, I can't even begin to describe it. Michael and I will never look at you the same again. How could you be so selfish? My wife just kept sobbing on the other end of the line, repeating how sorry she was. Julia paused, letting her cry, and I motioned for the phone. I took it and called out, Emily. Silence. I said her name again, Emily. She finally responded, yes, babe, but I wasn't having it. You've lost the right to call me that. More crying from her. I stayed firm. I just want to know, what are you really sorry for? If I hadn't come home early, would you have even realized the seriousness of what you were doing, or would you have kept sleeping with your boss after our trip? Her response was more sobbing, no real answer. You're not sorry for what you've done or who you've hurt. Not me, not our kids, not even his family. You're just sorry because you got caught. I hung up the phone, feeling hollow inside. Michael, Julia, and I sat around talking a bit more, mostly trying to process what had happened, while my phone kept buzzing non-stop. I tried to sleep that night, but couldn't. The next morning, 
I asked Michael to drive me home. I hugged Julia, thanking them both for everything they'd done for me. I told Michael I planned to go to my cabin for a few days to clear my head. He agreed that getting away was probably for the best. As we were driving, I noticed a message from my wife's boss wife mixed in with all the other notifications. She thanked me for telling her the truth and gave me her email address, asking for any details I could share. I forwarded her the video and offered to talk if she needed it. Maybe it'd help both of us make sense of this mess. When I got back to the house, I quietly packed my things, making sure not to disturb Darlene and Ryan. I loaded up the and grabbed a couple of my .22 rifles. Michael noticed and gave me a look. You know I usually do some target practice up there, I said, trying to brush it off. Not this time, he shot back, taking the guns away from me. He wasn't wrong. Cooper and I drove up to the cabin, about two and a half hours away. As soon as we arrived, I opened up the place, started a fire, and took a long walk in the woods. It helped, but only a little. My son called to check on me, and I told him where I was. I told him that if his mom wanted to stay at the house, that was fine, but she needed to be gone before I returned. He understood. After the walk, Cooper passed out by the fireplace, and I went outside to chop firewood. It was a hell of a workout and strangely therapeutic. With each swing of the axe, I imagined my wife's face, or her boss's, trying to work through the rage. I stayed at the cabin for the rest of the weekend, just trying to find some clarity. Monday morning came and I started making calls. First, I called my office to let them know I'd be out for a while, but was available for emergencies. Next, I called my lawyer who recommended a divorce attorney, and I set up an appointment for later in the week. I also contacted the bank to put a freeze on our joint accounts and cancel all shared credit cards. Alone in the woods, I finally started to clear my head enough to make some decisions. But at the same time, I found myself trembling, doubting whether I could actually go through with a divorce or if there was anything left to save. When I returned home, I stumbled across this subreddit and started reading through other people's stories. It helped, but only a little. Later that week, I went back to the office and spoke to my HR manager. She and I have always had a close professional relationship, but this conversation was about to get a lot more personal. I explained the situation and asked her for advice about dealing with my wife's company and her boss. She told me to check with my lawyer first, then she suggested I get tested and recommended a good doctor. I scheduled an appointment for Thursday. Meeting with the new lawyer felt like another punch to the gut, but this time I was able to actually sit through the video. She watched it, shook her head, and sighed. Why do people do such stupid things? She muttered. Turns out, she had zero tolerance for cheaters. Her own husband had cheated on her, which led her to switch her practice to divorce law. She reassured me that I'd get through this and helped me outline the next steps. I signed a contract with her, and we talked about what to do next regarding the other spouses and my wife's boss. She advised we hold off on contacting anyone else for the time being. I've since had a sit down with my wife. She's been staying at our son's place, which I appreciate because I needed space. She wasn't at the house when I came back, thankfully. I've been sleeping on the couch because I can't bring myself to sleep in our bedroom. Every time I need something, I grab as much as possible to avoid going back in there. Thank you to everyone who's made it this far. It's taken me forever to type this out, and writing about my daughter had me in tears for hours. Here's where I stand, and I want to provide another update. First, I have to express my deepest gratitude for the advice and support I've received from this community. I can't even begin to repay all the kindness, but please know that your words have been a lifeline. I've read every comment and message, and I'm trying my best to respond. Many of you have commended me for staying strong during the confrontation, but honestly, I don't feel strong at all. I'm just surviving, going through the motions, trying to keep it together. The advice and encouragement have been incredibly helpful and are pushing me to move forward. 
The reason I'm sharing this and why I posted the original story is because I needed help and thankfully I got plenty. My first post was removed because it was more of a story than a call for support, but I think sharing these details is important. I'm starting to come to terms with the fact that there may be no way back from this, and I'm almost certain about what I need to do. Still, I can't shake the thought that I'd be throwing away 29 years of shared life, memories, and moments. Even now, I can't bring myself to type with my ex-wife. I still call her my wife. What's wrong with me? I'm begging for clarity and guidance. On D-Day, after everything blew up, she went to stay at our son's house. He called me, confused and asking why I'd kicked his mom out. I told him that she needed to explain things, or I would. He already knew I was staying with Michael. Later, my daughter came home to find the dog wasn't there, and eventually, she showed up at Michael's house, desperate for answers. The look on her face when I told her the truth about her mother's affair was a pain deeper than anything I felt finding out about the affair itself. That moment shattered me. She took the dog and went back to the house with her fiancé. That Saturday morning, I told Michael I needed some time alone and asked him to drop me at the house so I could pack up and head to the cabin for a few days. He agreed, and I took Cooper with me. Spending time walking in the woods and chopping firewood was cathartic in its own way. A good workout, and it helped me clear my head a bit. I stayed until Monday, then drove home, feeling a little more grounded. Monday was when I started making calls, first to the bank, then to the credit card companies, and finally to my lawyer. He recommended a divorce attorney, and I met with her that Thursday. She watched the video, shook her head, and said, why do people do such stupid things? She shared that she has no patience for cheaters, her husband had cheated on her, and it was so bad she switched to practicing divorce law. I hired her on the spot. I asked about confronting my wife's boss and his HR department, and she advised me to hold off for now. Now I'm back at the house, still sleeping on the couch. I can't bring myself to go into our bedroom for anything except clothes. On Friday, my son called and told me that my wife couldn't stay at their place anymore, because it was causing tension with his wife. He asked if she could come back home. I hadn't spoken to her since D-Day, but reluctantly, I agreed. She came back on Saturday, and I immediately went back to the cabin. It was freezing, but I made do. On Monday, I went straight to the office. Cooper got spoiled by everyone there, which helped lift my spirits a bit. I didn't come home until Monday night. When I finally saw my wife again, all I could picture was her with her boss in our bed. I don't think I'll ever be able to erase that image from my mind. We didn't speak. I changed, went to the basement, and kept myself busy. Eventually, I put on some TV, and she came downstairs asking if we could talk. I told her I wasn't ready and asked her to leave me alone. I ended up falling asleep in the recliner and woke up early, went to the gym, and showered there before heading back to work. For the rest of the week, I stuck to the same routine, working late and avoiding the house as much as possible. On Friday, my HR manager checked in on me, and I told her a bit about what had happened. She suggested I stop sleeping on couches and chairs and that maybe I should buy a new bed. It was good advice. I withdrew half of the funds from our joint account, her share, and bought a new bed. The delivery was set for Saturday. When the delivery guys arrived, I treated them to subs for lunch and gave them each $25, asking them for a favor. Not to take away the old mattress but to leave it leaned against a tree near the street. They seemed puzzled, but I told them, just give me five minutes, then come inside. You'll understand. I went upstairs, stripped the old bed, and grabbed a can of Blaze Orange spray paint. I wrote in large letters across the mattress. Wife cheated on me in our bed. When the delivery guys came back in, my wife asked what was going on. I told her calmly, I can't sleep in that bed anymore, so I bought a new one. She looked upset but didn't say much and retreated downstairs. 
Meanwhile, the old mattress was left out for the entire neighborhood to see. Valentine's Day came around, and she tried to initiate intimacy, wanting to be romantic. I refused her coldly, telling her I wouldn't sleep with her again, even if she were the last woman on earth. She tried to argue that when we're together, we don't just have sex, we make love. I told her bluntly that we hadn't made love since she started sleeping with her boss. She looked genuinely shocked, as if she thought I'd forgotten. I couldn't comprehend her thought process. It was clear we needed to talk, so I asked her to sit down in the living room. I asked her outright what she wanted. Should we try to fix things, or should we just go ahead and get a divorce? I don't even know why I brought up reconciliation. Maybe it's because the idea of throwing away 29 years still haunts me. Convince me otherwise. She said she was willing to do whatever it took to make things right and begged for forgiveness. I told her the first step was confessing everything to our entire family, starting with her parents and my mom, including the details of how I found out. Our kids don't know all of that yet, but they're coming over tonight. I'll update you on how that goes. That's where I am right now. I'm still in shock, and the urge to confront her boss is overwhelming. I need some advice. What should I do next? When will things start to improve, or is this just how my life will be from now on? Update. That evening, my mom, my dad passed away a few years ago. Her parents, her sister, and brother-in-law all came over. We gathered in the living room, and I made sure to sit as far from her as possible. The family started offering the usual comforting words. What's wrong? We love you. Everything's going to be okay. Clearly thinking someone was sick or seriously hurt. I glanced at her and said, this story isn't going to tell itself. Her dad shot me a look, and I could see that he knew something awful was about to unfold. To her credit, she tearfully confessed everything, even the part where I caught her and her boss in our bed. After a long, suffocating silence, she pleaded, somebody say something. I couldn't hold it in anymore. What are they so?